10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello and welcome to AI4's end of 2020 event. What's next in Enterprise AI? We're excited for you to meet our incredible speakers who are leading AI initiatives at Fortune 500 companies. And a special thanks to our sponsors, Algorithmia, TigerGraph, Beyond Minds, and the others who make our events possible. Since we're all about artificial intelligence, we thought it made sense to have an AI welcome you to this amazing event. Without any further ado, please allow me to introduce, from roll please, myself. In case you couldn't notice, I'm an AI-generated actor. To create this welcome video, our co-founder Michael Weiss simply typed this script into a text box and then the computer did the rest. AI-generated synthetic media like myself can be used in many ways, from marketing videos to movies. Lucky for you, I represent just the tip of the AI iceberg. Today you will encounter many exciting innovations and business applications that are only made possible thanks to intelligent machines. I wish you an amazing conference experience. Now I'll introduce a human to say hello as well. Take it away, Putrika. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the AI4 2020 What's Next in Enterprise AI Summit. We're so glad to have everyone here. My name is Patrika Elise, and I'll be your MC for the next hour of the show. We've got some incredible content lined up for you today. I just have a few quick housekeeping items to run through before we get started. This conference, as you've probably noticed, runs on the SwapCard events platform. I want to take a minute now to point out one quick feature. In order to find your personalized agenda, meetings and conversations with other attendees, simply click on the My Schedule and Meetings button, which you can find either here or here. By clicking into this feature, you'll be able to see your personalized agenda, view your meetings and meeting requests, and see your networking conversations. And that's it. We think you'll find SwapCard very intuitive and easy to use. Now that you're familiar with the SwapCard platform and how to use it, I just want to highlight one more thing before we begin the show. And that is the networking event that we have planned for you in a few hours at 5 p.m. Eastern. You definitely won't want to miss it because today's networking event will feature a team-based activity called the puzzle. The Puzzle is an online team problem-solving game where you'll work together to solve a series of individual puzzles to unlock the answer to the master puzzle. It'll be a fun way to connect with other conference growers through a memorable shared experience. Now, let the AI4 What's Next in Enterprise AI show begin! I'll now welcome Daniel Lackland, content lead at AI4, to introduce today's agenda and the first speaker. Thank you, Patrika. And welcome everybody to the AI4 2020 What's Next in Enterprise AI Summit event. As Patrika mentioned, I'm Daniel Lackland, content lead at AI4, and I've been working these past months to gather the best and most informative speakers possible. I'm excited to have you here, and I hope you'll find value over the next few hours. AI4 was started in 2018 by two people who wanted AI to succeed and believed in the power of connecting people through events. These two college friends, Michael Weiss and Marcus Jekyllin, wanted industry to find value in AI so that the technology would continue to draw investment and improve. They wanted the world to adopt AI and to do so responsibly. What started as a 400 person AI for finance specific event in Brooklyn is now a community tens of thousands strong that includes hundreds of the world's largest and most influential companies from across the finance, healthcare, retail, cybersecurity, telecom, automotive energy, and tech industries. Beyond our events, AI4 has become a broader community, a one-stop shop for all things AI and industry. If you like our conferences, we hope you'll take advantage of our other resources too, including the AI4 blog, the weekly newsletter, AI Industry News, our AI product discovery platform, and our brand new AI jobs board with more than 1,000 AI job postings. You can easily find all of these resources at any time by visiting our website, AI4.io. Okay, enough about us. Now let me introduce you to our first speaker today. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Satyam Priyadarshi, 
Dr. Priya Darshi is chief data scientist at Halliburton, and he is a veteran of the data science scene. He is a global leader who transforms businesses by leveraging big data, data science, and emerging technologies. As the key AI leader at a Fortune 150 company, there are few better to kick off an AI for Enterprise conference. Please join me in welcoming Satyam to the stage with some virtual claps. Thank you very much, Satyam. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are attending from. We live in the era of compounded disruption and we all hear about artificial intelligence being used in everything today. So I want to discuss something about the valuable AI and how do we tame the compounded disruption. At the very onset, let me actually thank a number of people who actually encourage me, empower me and enable me to speak on these topics. Most importantly, my school teachers after my parents and then my PhD advisor, you can see their pictures on the left hand side. And then of course my family, my extended family and a lot of my friends and their families because before COVID I used to travel a lot uh, and I used to visit them uh, so I can get good food actually. But then of course, most importantly, like all of you who are attending this event and and that's the most important part and the invitation that I got from Daniel and his team. Now, what I want to cover is the, the application of artificial intelligence, right? Why is, why, what needs to be done? It should be like continuous. It has to be contact in the right context and it should be comprehensive because what we are trying to do is uh, talking about AI in a very generic term and then it confuses a lot of people. And especially when we are talking about the era of compounded disruption. So I'll, I'll say how we can actually, what is needed to generate the value from AI rather than talking about just AI in everything. So if you look at it, <clears throat> artificial intelligence is not new, right? The concept was about 50, 60 years ago, talked about as is to mimic human intelligence, but its use responsibly and how to remain effective will actually make us a player in what I call industry 4.0 era and uh, and beyond when the machine to machine communication becomes stronger than human to machine communication. And in if we look at it, then what we need to really do, it's the application of artificial intelligence in the right context to generate value is much better application of artificial intelligence than gen the greatest hype about AI in small things and, and suddenly saying AI is in this, AI is in that. It's about what value can we create. So what is the compounded disruption that we talk about? If you look at uh, last couple of years, you will see these are some of the uh, disruptions that are taking place uh, first. Uh, all about digital transformation, digitization, digitalization. So this digital maturity is pretty mis misunderstood concept. Uh, and uh, so that is causing a disruption. Second is the evil, the pace at which emerging technologies are coming and and the pace at which we are actually adopting them is, a, is there is a gap and that gap is growing significantly in many industries, whereas some industries are able to keep up with it. And since I work for energy industry, there is a whole concept of energy transition landscape, and that's, that is evolving into a complex landscape, as we all know. And something that we didn't, we would not have talked about until uh, December, November or December of 2019, that's the impact of a pandemic, which is still unknown. A lot of things are unknown about this. Uh, as we can see, the use of artificial intelligence algorithms and models haven't resulted much in much success of predicting anything about this uh, pandemic as well. Then, how does it all relate to? It actually relates in the failure of strategy that we have 
the execution remains out of sync because we don't know how to address those uh, deep uh, disruptions and the talent readiness in certain industries is really a challenge whether how do we take a digital transformation going forward so but but if you think of it the digital maturity plays a significant role and digital is at the core of a core of our, of any business today and for us it is a, it has been very important and since in the context of oil and gas industry i can tell you that it it is it is critical because it actually reduces the cost to produce energy as well as reduce it, reduces the time to find the first oil as we call it and then of course reduces and increases the value of all the across the entire value chain the performance the operational value and 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 the value of the talent that is being uh, leveraged to create this uh, uh, digital driven solutions now if you look at it how does that simple digital value creation takes place in a very simple concept uh, it is as simple as building you leveraging a data universe then you build a, what i call data science models i have on purpose not used pure artificial intelligence here because artificial intelligence is a subset of data science and then building these inference engines so that you can build what i call actionable insights of course it's a very simple way of putting things in a four bucket but the underlying there is more complexity that goes behind in order to achieve these actionable insights so you can create value uh, across the life cycle what we use is um, a, what is called a smart approach now this smart approach is different from the smart that you le learn into hr and leadership courses here it is all related to how do i create data driven innovation that is how do i simplify from data ingestion to data value creation how do i mash up data sets that we would never never thought of it how do i do these things in an agile fashion because if you build a model once how do i actually incorporate new data sets that are coming and then how does it extend the reachability of that model beyond a small silo so their context gets bigger and better and then of course all these things have to be done in a technology agnostic manner this is the smart approach that we have actually built over the last couple of years uh, for data driven innovation and and this results uh, in significant value this is i'm talking about valuable ai this is very important there is an example here of actually leveraging artificial intelligence algorithms which has been modified from typical no natural language processing to something i called it a uh, technology language processing uh, which are unique in its own terms so that i can extract uh, c which is the symptoms events and action from what is called unstructured data and here in this case uh, by mining something like 9 uh, 16000 plus pdf files and this small section of that pdf files we were able to actually show a value worth 200 million per year Uh, for what is called reduction in two percent of non-productive time, so when you are applying these artificial intelligence algorithms uh, in the right context, significant value is generated, <clears throat> and that's how actually it defines the strategy to move forward in applications of these artificial intelligence algorithms. In order to do that, one has to understand that that this foundation actually lies. in the what i call the talent transformation because as i said earlier context is very very critical uh, one actually already in talks about design thinking and digital and cloud paradigms but these all have to come together to actually disrupt the compounded disruptions that i talked to you earlier but the talent plays a significant role now when when we leverage this um, foundational aspects of uh, digital maturity we can actually generate value in all aspects of oil well life cycle in this case an example but i can talk about other industry verticals from my past experience as well but you can actually do a systematic manner and leverage these exponential technologies uh, to actually generate value so some of those exponential technologies that we can talk about if uh, are this ecosystem that is the cloud computing paradigm the sensor paradigm the robotics the drones 
uh, augmented and virtual reality. And of course, uh, as we all know, cybersecurity becomes an ingra ingrained component of all these technologies. And eventually uh, to deal with the uh, data and other things, this cryptography and others, blockchain will play a significant role as well. If once, once one has leveraged those things, then we can actually see that the value creation can be very comprehensive. That is, one can actually democratize the data uh, in a way that you don't have to share the data, but democratize the knowledge so that you can build integrated view of your business life cycle and look at things in a real time fashion and eventually build what is an autonomous system or in some cases people would call it digital twin. Uh, and, and this is that value generation from a leveraging artificial intelligence is, is actually very, very important. And what I talked to you in a very, very simple terms, why valuable AI is more important than just talking about AI or narrow AI or explainable AI. From, for my definition, everything that we do in AI has to be explainable if it generates value. So uh, otherwise uh, there is no point. So explainability is an internal, internal core of artificial intelligence. How much value you generate is cr critical. And with that, many of these things uh, I have written and there are some other, especially in oil and gas sector, there are some other books that people have written. You can read them. Uh, with that, I will stop here. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Satyam. Our next speaker, Diego Oppenheimer, embodies what the AI industry is all about. After spending more than five years at Microsoft, Diego started a company seven years ago called Algorithmia that is focused on helping enterprises adopt AI and actually reap value from their AI investments. Ultimately, making AI work in an enterprise production setting isn't an easy task, and Algorithmia has been at the forefront of making AI easy. Over 110,000 engineers and data scientists have used Algorithmia's platform to date, including the United Nations, government intelligence agencies, and Fortune 500 companies. Join me in welcoming Diego to our stage. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So let me go ahead and hit real quick and share my screen. Uh, great. So today what we'll be talking about is MLOps and the rise of governance. And so the, the, the core of what we've been talking about is that you know AI is no longer this theoretical science. Um, what we're really seeing right now is enterprises really seeing uh, what machine learning and AI can do for their organizations. They're looking at how they're going to mature their deployment uh, and building of ML applications. How are they going to get through the hurdles to overcome that? Um, how they're going to increase their maturity and really get to that point where we're industrializing the operations behind machine learning, uh, specifically the life cycle and how we actually do monitoring, reporting, and auditing. So I'll be talking a lot about this, uh, you know, today um, in a guide on to how we can explore that governance, how we can explore that uh, maturity level. Uh, but really quickly about myself, I'm the CEO and founder of Algorithmia. Uh, I've been working on data tools for over 15 years uh, and building in those app uh, across the board. So every year, Algorithmia does a survey around how ML is being used in the enterprise, who's using it, what are the use cases. And one of the interesting things is, uh, in case anybody didn't realize, there's a big pandemic this year, um, and that has a, a pretty big shift in terms of how organizations look at what they're doing. And so one of the clear things was that uh, of organizations looking at how their spend was doing, how they're forecasting, how their use cases, ML is top of mind and increasing spend across of this. So that's a pretty clear indication that we're moving away from this innovation or exploratory world into real things that have real ROI and actually change the course of our businesses, seeing this actual reinvestment in that. And a couple of the use cases that we see, increasing customer experience, reduction in costs, um, looking at fraud. So this is a, a, across the board, we saw an increase in uh, these use cases that can be actually addressed with machine learning and AI. So when we look at the maturity, right, of machine learning operations and management, where are the challenges? What are the things that are actually avoiding organizations actually be able to uh, get you know, up and running. So the first one is stuck in the lab. So this is how do we actually go from a laptop or a data science or a workbook or a notebook or Jupyter notebook into actual production? How do we actually make that move into a production environment? 
disconnected teams. How is my data science and machine learning team talking to the DevOps teams, talking to the governance teams, talking to the risk teams? How are we actually getting all on the same page in terms of how we're going to go actually get these machine learning models in production? Technology mismatch is around the massive amount of frameworks and technology investment. There's a new framework every day. How do we actually match those two things up? Are we using Python? Are you using Java? Are you using R? How does an organization get around, you know, being actually built for repeatability and scale and security? Stakeholder buy-in, how do we actually get our C-levels to sponsor these projects, get behind them, see why they're worth investing in and continue to unblock us in actually getting these work, uh, workloads into production. And then as we create this massive uh, roadmap of dev tools and DevOps tools and machine learning tools, how do we maintain those? How do we actually run those at scale? How do we make sure that we're like, continuing to move forward the, our platforms? So each one of these contributes quite a bit into an inefficient machine learning life cycle. And this translates into about 50% of machine learning projects never see the light of day. But, and sometimes it takes over 18 months to go from a lab to deploying these models in production, and that becomes extremely problematic. So when we look at maturity, and we this is a self-assessment type of thing, how do we actually determine maturity inside an organization? So we have organizational alignment, we have data, we have training, we have deployment, we have management, we have governance. And each one of these, we put a low, medium, high around it. So when we talk about organizational alignment, you know, a low is there's no dedicated data scientists. These are two tools that are actually chosen by any practitioner. Everything's ad hoc. So one of the things here is this is a clear place where you'll be stuck in the lab, right? What happens when we actually need to get this into production? How are we going to go do this? A high level of maturity, by contrast, is when we actually start having these centralized data science services, standard ops and management platforms, and actually KPIs and performance management that actually allows you to go, uh, you know, grow on that. And so what we really want to get to is how do we actually make model reuse to be easy? How do we actually look at what the, the, the business demand is and actually justify the investments that we're doing from an organizational perspective? And then how do we get to get those budget justifications for projects? So we want to move up this organization, uh, this organizational alignment maturity level to get to a high level degree where we can actually get these kind of investments. So where does ROI for AI and ML happen? Well, the first one is in optimizations, improving productivity, reducing costs. You know, while we, the second level is this improved decision-making tranche where we have these improved customer experience, revenue, margin. These first two categories are where 90% of the successful projects are today. And it makes sense because these are the ones that are attainable, they can be defined, they can be brought in into a, a measured and actually achieved in a somewhat short period of time. Where we, we tend to go, try to go do is in this business model innovation. We want to disrupt industries. We want to create new markets, new revenue streams. And the value truly is transformational, but also so is the risk. And so when we look at an organization and actually building, assess where you are from a maturity perspective, because if you're in a low maturity perspective from an organizational alignment and you're going straight for the business model innovation, uh, you know, kind of the disruption, this is going to be problematic. And so actually being able to go through a crawl, walk, run type of process becomes a good way of focusing on this. And again, what are we looking at? What, what happens when we don't do these things? Well, time to production is gonna be costly to us. We're gonna lose the opportunity of these models and the labor and infrastructure, scalability, capacity, resiliency, and maintenance are gonna become problematic if we don't address these early on. So when we talk about data and training, right? Low is you know really ad hoc, individual data owners, and data scientists, limited IT oversight of these projects. You're going to have data quality problems, access problems, cleaning problems, and this actually drives to a really expensive training, uh, uh, you know, the process. How do I get to my data? How do I get the proper clean data? How do I can I actually access it? And so, what we really want to do is drive our organization towards a high level of maturity in the data and training. So, how do we actually? Some organizations look at it having a chief data officer or subject matter experts that can actually own the data streams, ETL, and the data management systems. We start looking at tools like data warehouses and data lakes, multiple machine learning frameworks, and then having an actual, you know, what we call a data first or a first class, data as a first class citizen inside an organization is the first step in actually increasing maturity so that you can actually achieve the ROI behind machine learning. So when we look at management, you know, we look at management and operations. So deployment and operations management is a really key part of focus. A low maturity level in an organization is usually data scientists are responsible for everything. 
They have to take everything from the data to the grading the model to deploying it to actually running it in production. And this is really hamstrings their capabilities. This will you'll see growing pains around time to production being way too long, path to production being uh, blocked by IT, limited tooling, and really everything is manual. I have to redo it over and over again. Once we start going into a medium level of maturity, you'll start seeing new personas popping up, data scientists, developers, DevOps engineers. They're gonna start automating with scripting. They're gonna have platform specific infrastructure management. And they're going to start looking at configuration specific automation and script management. How do we actually create some sort of repeatability? This is a great step forward. And then immediately what you're going to see, you know, in terms of growing pains here are how does our infrastructure start growing a lot larger than expected? How do we actually integrate with our current DevOps tooling uh, that already exists? And how do we start eating away at that tech that up? tech that, that is actually piling up. So when I look at a high degree of maturity in this space, we're seeing data scientists, developers, and DevOps all working together. They're looking at tools that are going to automate this entire workflow. So you're looking at deployment automation and role-specific tools. And then from an ops perspective, one button deployment, full uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment integration, completely infrastructure agnostic tooling, and now integrated into the DevOps components that an organization exists. Because once you can actually achieve that level of integration, you can now actually have the data scientists, developers, and DevOps working on the same page, working on the same process, which again is, how do we get ROI out of our machine learning efforts? Well, we put them in production. You will never get ROI unless we get them into production. So the faster we get them into production, the faster the value that we're going to be able to actually achieve behind this. So we want to build that stack that matches your needs, right? So today we usually see a lack of defined technology stack or best practices. There's no building for repeatability, measurability, auditability. Again, this drives back to how do we actually do governance and what's happening inside my organization with ML. We don't want proprietary locking into specific tooling. I can't have an entire governance stack for one kind of model and another governance stack for another kind of model. That's just never going to work. How do we, we're not thinking about data access. And so what we really want to do to increase our maturity level is how do we best build the, the best ML architecture for my organization? I'm going to have a wide variety of data science tooling. I'm likely going to have one or two, at least infrastructure providers. I'm going to have more than one deployment technology. And then I have defined paths for continuous integration, continuous deployment inside my organization, application integrations. And at the end of the day, what of these applications or the end user are going to be actually consuming this machine learning. So being able to map this inside your organization, understand on how we actually go from a built model all the way to being consumed and what, how we can build that out from a repeatable way is extremely important for success and getting to an ROI point with your machine learning efforts. So, how do we actually democratize ML inside an organization? Well, what we want to do is create an ML platform or ops platform that is highly flexible, highly extensible, and highly integratable. We want to be able to use whatever data science tooling we want. We want to be able to connect to whatever data services. We want to be able to track our code and are in, in with a, the same way that we track any other code. We want the widest variety of ability to use different frameworks and libraries. And we want to be able to lay this down on the computational resources, which are convenient from a cost, data security, or governance perspective that I've determined, and the full flexibility of calling these ML models from whatever kind of application I want. And so when we start thinking about how do we build for the future? How do we build for repeatability? How do we build? We really want to take that integration first approach, understand what's laid down inside my organization. How am I actually going to plug in all these operations into that? So let's think about governance. How do we actually increase our maturity in governance? So the lowest level is there is none, right? And we've seen this quite a bit. You've probably seen this inside your organizations, data scientists, working on their own, tracking models inside spreadsheets, there's no ops. There's an increasing number of data sets, there's no compliance. We actually get to that point where we can't answer the question of who called what, when, with what data and why. And that now becomes an extremely big risk, especially when we're automating operations with uh, machine and decision-making with machine learning. We get to that medium level of maturity. Data scientists, developers, and DevOps are already personas that exist in your organization. There's disconnected reporting tool, usually by business unit, maybe by framework, maybe by tool that they're using. And so everything around management is completely ad hoc. 
How do we actually audit multiple models and data access for compliance? How do we understand what models are going to drift, which where is the noticeable impact, and what are my investments on an organizational level are looking at? So we really want to try to move towards that high level of governance and maturity, which is working together, data scientists, developers, DevOps, chief, chief risk officers. From a tooling perspective, you want to start looking at MLOps as a governance platform. Who's calling what, with what data, what time, at all times being able to answer that. How do I attach my investments in a specific model to the cost of running that model, but also to the ROI that my, the business is actually getting from that model? And then from an ops perspective, how do we actually determine access, policy, reporting, integrated with the tooling today? Let's be real, right? Governance already exists in IT today. There's restrictions around access controls. There's restrictions about computational resources. There's uh, auditability on how these things are being used. How do we start taking advantage? How does our MLOps platform start sending data to those systems so that you can actually integrate with them in the same way that you're doing at the rest of your technology stack? So governance and security become super important. From a governance perspective, how do we manage your ML lifecycle with tools to support internal and external compliance? Performance monitoring for model risk, model and data access controls, user group access controls, tracking and reporting on metrics, and then having chargebacks and showbacks. Who called what, what, when? How do we pass that bill? Nobody wants to take the entire PNL of running ML at scale in an organization on theirs. And then from a security perspective, again, how do we start bringing in the best practices of my IT security organizations? Data at rest and flight encryption, network security integrations, private and public certificate authorities, authenticated proxies, SSO support, air-gapped environments. So again, this is what brings in all under the governance and security. How do we manage across infrastructure, data, network, and models? And how do we do that with the policies that exist today in our organization? So what you wanna really do is be charting your own maturity level, understanding where you are today and how you can actually increase that. And so being honest and auditing on a regular basis, hey, how do I actually look at you know, where I am today, low, medium, on each one of these individual uh, elements, identify where, you know, we can do that and how do we actually get to that increase? And really, how do you know that you've, you've achieved the high level of maturity? Well, you now start seeing executives who can identify challenges like wasted productivity, versioning, cost management. We can actually answer which models are being used where where our risk is coming from, where our, uh, our cost is coming from, where we should continue investing in these areas where ML can really drive forward our operations. So one way of thinking about these maturity uh, milestones and what I want to offer is kind of an operational litmus test of sorts for MLOps. On a security side, can I actually integrate with my current security models from an infrastructure data and model perspective? Can I actually support governance and compliance reporting? Can I actually scale my infrastructure for uh, cost uh, uh, for cost and performance? Can I monitor all my, mo my models in a global way for drift, risk, and performance? And now what my speed looks like from a deploying models in hours, not days or weeks, and providing model reusability and automation. So if I can actually answer these things inside my organization, you might actually have achieved a quite high level of maturity. But if not, there's an easy way of actually moving forward on that and looking at assessing where you are today and how you can actually move that forward. So really quickly and to kind of start wrapping up, Algorithmia Enterprise, for those of you who know, is a model deployment uh, operations and governance platform. It allows you to connect, load, catalog, version, and validate models in production. We could take care of managing the cost, controlling the infrastructure, providing you full usage metrics and operations in the fastest way to get your models into production and a full governance and security layer that integrates with your IT policies today inside your organization. For those of you who wanna map out where you are today, you can actually download the roadmap to ML maturity. You can actually chart where you are today and look at what the next steps to increasing your maturity inside your organization. And again, each organization is gonna be on a different path. You might've achieved high levels of maturity in some areas, low levels of maturity in others. And this is a good guide, completely product agnostic, to actually understand where you are and how you can achieve the next milestone. And with that said, I'm gonna start wrapping up. I wanna thank everybody very much for listening to me today. And it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Wow, thank you, Diego. Now is the time when we're going to talk about AI and COVID. 
To share the impact AI has had on COVID and the implications for enterprises, we have Romy Hussein. Romy leads the centralized AI program for Johns Hopkins, and her work has been instrumental in helping their system treat COVID patients and in helping the state of Maryland respond appropriately to the pandemic. Romy's perspective is an interesting one, filled with hope for the benefit of AI and responding to a catastrophe, but also with caution due to policymakers' less than data-driven decision-making approach. Please welcome Romy to the virtual stage. Thanks so much for your warm welcome. And it's such a pleasure to be here again with you at AI4. Thanks for being here. I wanted to come to talk to you guys today about the ways in which AI can support enterprise level projections, enhance operational optimization, both in the healthcare industry and beyond, and help prevent future infectious disease outbreaks. As a little bit of background, I lead a team at John Hopkins that's responsible for providing decision intelligence support for Hopkins executive leadership. In other words, helping our executive team make better decisions using the right analytical tool for the job at hand with the data that we have available to us. Sometimes it's a hard job, sometimes it's next to impossible. What I've learned, however, particularly in the course of the pandemic, is that data-driven decision-making can push organizations to make better decisions that are replicable, low in variance in terms of the quality of their outcomes, and scalable in ways that we simply couldn't do by relying on our personal decision-making heuristics alone. There are three primary vectors of decision-making intelligence and support offered by AI, prediction, optimization, and prevention. There are others, but these are the ones I wanna focus on today. Now, these benefits can be tapped into by policymakers and corporations alike. In fact, in the absence of a coordinated, widespread national response, they absolutely should be tapped into to ensure that responses are rooted in local realities and the science driving them. Much like the data science community itself, which is based on principles of open source transparency and shared best practice, I'll be using models from around the world during this talk. Not only the models that my team and I have created ourselves. In a fast moving, ever changing environment, like the one that COVID-19 puts us into, it's imperative that we learn from as many examples as we have available to us and share our learning in turn so that as many lives as possible can be saved in the process. On that note, the first and perhaps most critical AI vector is prediction. AI has the ability to answer critical questions about the next stage of the pandemic, what its impact is likely to be on both individuals and populations within an organization's purview. At Hawkins, for example, we model impacts around our patient populations. However, we've also completed similar models for state governments, even multinational corporations, to help them assess some of their own risk factors and develop their internal levels of risk tolerance so that they can gain the insight they need to make the best possible decisions for their own constituents. Two key model types emerged during the course of the pandemic and proved to have exceptional usefulness in predicting pandemic phases and the interaction of various events. One's old, based on the traditional epidemiological math, uh, on the left, you see the SEIRD, steered model. One's really new or surprisingly new in the corporate decision intelligence space. And it belongs to a growing, exciting branch of decision science called multi-agent systems. That's the one that you see on the right. Now, the steered model has lots of different flavors. It's the interplay over time, the exchange between various disease states. People can go from susceptible to exposed, to infected, to recovered, presumed immune, and then deceased. Different infectious diseases use different states to model them out. So the common cold, for example, you would only go from susceptible to infected, then back to susceptible. For COVID-19, we actually need all five states to appropriately model the pandemic's flow. Agent-based modeling, the one on the right, however, uses individual agents whose rule-based behavior can take many forms. Agents can interact collaboratively, competitively, even adversarially. We'll talk more about these systems later. For now, suffice it to say that the SEERD models are really useful for absolute and accurate predictions, whereas agent-based models are better for predicting 
multiple scenarios involving groups of individuals or pods to identify the relativity of results under different operating scenarios. Predicting how the disease will spread based on gradual reopening of society can help policymakers to understand what effects their decisions could have on complex social webs of individuals. This is where those multi-agent systems really shine. By putting these two types of models together, we we're actually able to accomplish a lot. We could start to predict the rate of transmission based on real-time data, see how it affected various types of patients, for example, those with pre-existing conditions or exacerbating comorbidities, and then seek to understand the thread within different types of communities, for example, urban versus rural. We could also start to test out using that agent-based sin what the impact of various policies might be. What would happen if a county or a state decides to shut its borders or mandate lockdowns? However, in the enterprise state, to be truly useful, we needed to test another type of potentiality, the economic one. Hospitals, payers, device companies, uh, pharma companies all experienced wildly different impacts of this pandemic. That's just the healthcare industry. Many hospitals, for example, were bled essentially dry financially while payers exhibited a windfall. So outside of healthcare more generally, there were real questions when it came to return to work safety and how that balanced out against financial concerns. Restaurants in the hospitality industry, for example, were impacted perhaps the most existentially. For them, knowing when normal operations could safely resume and at what capacity was critical to decision makers as they attempted to navigate both the public health and the economic landscape. For restaurants in particular, the difference between opening a month early at 25% capacity or delaying another month from reopening at 50% capacity can be a huge difference. It could be make or break from a cash flow perspective. This is where those agent-based simulations, again, really come to the fore. We can start to get an idea of how likely different scenarios are to actually occur. As wonderful as all these models are, and they are pretty fantastic, there's not one in existence that describes reality perfectly, not one. Turns out that the wisdom of crowds actually applies to models as well. The CDC took an ensemble approach by merging dozens of different models to describe their, to derive their own projections. So when you hear CDC forecasts, it's actually a basket of models taken together that are compiled to form surprisingly robust predictions. If you look really closely on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see a tiny, you might see a tiny little green line. That's actually the Hawkins model. You can see that there's an incredibly wide variance, however, in the predicted confidence intervals of all these models. But astoundingly, when taken together, they tend to describe the actual with remarkable consistency. Ensemble approaches and machine learning in general tend to yield superior results especially in volatile environments with a lot of unknowns. And this instance was no different. On the right, you can see the composite model that actually has a pretty tight uh, confidence boundary around it. And when I say tight, I mean that it's, it's centered around the actual results of the pandemic. So that's a highly predictive and relatively robust result. I contrast this to the White House Coronavirus Task Force briefings, which relied on a single model alone, and one which, at that, wasn't initially rooted in scientific precedent per se. It was incredibly difficult for the country to make good decisions based on that single model with, that had a large error variance bouncing around day by day. Sometimes it was you know, twice what it was the day before. Instead, taking the data science route and blending many forecasts was both more stable and secure over time. There are a lot of reasons that we would want to get the disease pred predictions themselves right. However, prediction isn't terribly useful if it's in a vacuum and if it doesn't inspire the right actions on the part of the enterprise, which leads me to the next point, operational optimization. Given we're in a pandemic, resource utilization will not be what it was in the BC era before COVID. Resources can be a lot of things here. For a hospital, it's intensive care beds, med beds, probably ventilators. For a city or county, 
Analyzing hospital resources at the level of granularity at which the decision must be made is critical. We saw clearly how some hospitals were relatively untouched by the pandemic, particularly those in wealthier areas. Their counterparts, however, often sometimes just a couple miles down the street, were inundated. Load balancing within a county, within a state, became critical to keeping the curve as flat as it could reasonably be. For the enterprise, maximizing resource utilization in many cases meant pivoting to new ways of doing business, much of it remote, and ensuring that those team, member, team members who did need to remain on-prem were protected up to the risk tolerance threshold of that particular organization. In the healthcare space in particular, we had a chance and opportunity to devise new ways of thinking about old problems really fast. The ER throughput optimization model is something that sort of every entry level MBA does in their first year. It's kind of the you know, crowning glory of resource utilization optimization. What we saw, however, went way beyond, transcended those B school basics into something far graver. But by blending linear optimizations of variables like bed use and provider availability with those agent-based systems that modeled out how patients with certain characteristics were likely to respond to various treatment types, we were able to get closer to a data-driven prioritization protocol that used the hospital's actual operational position at that point in time with modeled scenarios of patient prognosis. Many of us heard about the tough choices that some clinicians faced and were forced to make, especially early on, in which they had to make snap judgments about, for example, which patients to put on a ventilator, which patients to give life-saving antiviral medications to, which ones to, di to discharge or keep under observation. Mistakes were almost certainly made, not because of human fallibility per se, but also because of a lack of a complete data set at any one node in the global healthcare web. One thing machines are actually pretty good at is parsing large data sets for subtle signals that we sometimes miss or simply can't access. So by sharing data sets widely across state, even national lines, many healthcare organizations were able to streamline their delivery operations. And some even adopted protocols like ours to support clinical diagnostics in real time. This is that part about the multi-agent systems that I promised earlier. Agent-based modeling is, again, relatively new in the corporate decision intelligence space. We model complex systems composed of individual actors or agents whose behavior is described using pretty simple rules. These rules can correspond to spatial patterns, where people live, where they work, social characteristics like the social determinants of health, health conditions, what their underlying comorbidities might be, and infection fundamentals under which the agents are interacting to characterize either the transmission process or a treatment process or some sort of policy intervention. So you can use them to do lots of different things. Take the Imperial College London agent-based system as an example. That's what you see here. It rose to prominence early on, bolstered both by the accuracy of its predictions, as well as the range of scenario modeling that it was capable of. Factors model included ones which aren't necessarily captured by traditional epidemiolo epidemiological models, those Sears models that we talked about earlier. Those edge cases turned out to be definitional to this pandemic. Think about the asymptomatic carriers or people who ended up uh, testing false uh, falsely negative, but then ended up being super spreaders within their community. ICL modeled out a number of policy interventions and then studied how the virus would ebb and flow with each. So here we see uh, home isolation of cases. People with symptoms of the disease are kept home for seven days, regardless of whether they test positive or not, home quarantine, we see social distancing, we see social distancing of uh, only folks elderly folks, people over the age of 70, or downright closures of schools and universities. You can really see the, in the ebbs and flows, the sort of peaks and troughs of this chart, the aggregated simulations playing out. The, that's imperative information to decision makers. who need to decide which one or two or three of these policies to roll out at any given point in time. 
here is a diagram of a return to work decision model that actually was created at Hopkins. The five steps work together seamlessly to help inform organizations what the earliest midpoints and latest possible safe return dates might be for a given risk threshold. This part's really important. Some organizations might decide that any risk is too much. While some may feel that a calculated closely monitored risk, particularly if they fall outside of a hotspot, is a reasonable risk to take. Again, this is gonna vary really widely by industry. Hospitality, retail, healthcare, um, consumer goods will tend to err on the more risk taking side here, simply because those organizations cannot function without on-prem staff. Whereas most professional services organizations, for example, will almost certainly opt for alternate arrangements in which the risk of uncontrolled indoor spread among office workers can be mitigated. Now, once we know what's likely to occur from the prediction steps, and we know how to optimize for our risk tolerance, with the resources that we have available to us from the optimization set, it comes time to implement measures to consolidate the progress we've made and to prevent future outbreaks. We saw, well, we see pretty clear call and response type dynamics between the times in which restrictions are imposed and the times when they're lifted. Take for example, the, the red spots here are the lockdowns, the green, spots on this upper chart are when lockdowns are lifted. You can see when the lifting happens, there is a gradual uptick in infectious disease spread. That might be a reasonable risk that in this case, the state of Maryland is willing to take. But we also see the behavioral impact of times when society deemed it maybe less necessary to maintain social distance and protocols. This is primarily around holidays. Take a look here in July, we're at a low, but then uh, you start to see this creep back up. You start to see the spike that's likely due to social laxity around the summer holidays. We actually never got that number all the way back down to the, the average of July. And now we're starting to see even more uncontrolled transmission as we go into the winter holidays. The slope uh, doesn't look like it's gonna let up anytime soon. Barring some pretty drastic measures like closed borders, mandatory masking, uh, mandatory lockdowns. So the cause and effect of behavior on the transmission rate really can't be denied. One preventative tool that many organizations have now adopted is a symptom screener app for employees or even consumers, customers who are located on premise. Some, however, are taking this idea a step further by injecting some predictive power into the process such as by triaging the organization's location with the local projections and an employee's individual risk factors. This is another model that came out of my team. I have to say, it's a little easier when you work in the healthcare industry and have access to things like clinical records, the world's best COVID tracking data. However, a modified version of this could likely be implemented at nearly any organization with enough willpower and really strong data governance around things like PHI. If implemented widely, systems like these can serve not only as individual decision support, should I go to the office today, but it also serves a tracking and tracing purpose that can start to inform predictive models even before positive tests start to register. We saw in many places that flu-like symptoms increased suddenly about a week before the first positive cases started arriving in the hospital. If we could contain an outbreak at its source, it goes a long way toward preventing the next one. There are almost too many use cases of AI in the healthcare industry to go into all of them. Let's just say that COVID has fundamentally changed the way that we measure the outcomes associated with healthcare, as well as the fundamental processes surrounding basic functions of the healthcare industry. AI is an amplifier. And it's made it clear that there's no great reason not to use advanced computation techniques to accelerate basic tasks like parking patient records or real world evidence. These are signals we might once have missed. Another piece of the puzzle is this. Healthcare experienced a once in a lifetime black swan event. 
patients weren't admitted or weren't operated on who would otherwise have been operated on in order to make room in the hospital for COVID patients. Those patients didn't sit at home patiently, no pun intended. Many of them exacerbated, they got worse over time, and then they ended up right back in the hospital, this time in the ER. We must learn the patterns from this incredibly unusual time when many providers took actions that they wouldn't normally have taken so that we can try to care for as many patients as possible with the right course of action. Reinforcement learning, which is do this, not that, modeling. It's a fascinating frontier here that my team and I are working furiously on, precisely so that we can start to help clinicians determine the best course of action for any given patient, even under suboptimal delivery conditions. This is truly the frontier of individualized care. When all is said and done, the bright spot that I'm taking away from the pandemic is the power of cooperation. From breakneck speed, vaccine development, to vast networks of data science teams sharing models, code, data sets, shared practices, to clinicians the world over pooling new information and observations daily to try to collectively learn and study this virus even as they were fighting it. What has become evident is that together, using the best tools available to each one of us individually, we have a shot at overcoming. Thank you so much. Would love to hear any questions that you guys have. Peace and masks. Thank you for sharing your insights with us, Romy. All right, that's it for the general session. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. We're going to take a short break and then at 2.30 Eastern time, the tracks will begin. We have two tracks today, each focused on across industry applications. One track is geared more towards business leaders and the other towards our data scientist community. Both have world-class speakers, so you can't go wrong. We'll be back together again at 5 p.m. for the special networking event, The Puzzle. Until then, enjoy.